Welcome back, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Crypto and Muay Thai Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Brookins. Uh, I'm super excited to welcome our special guest today, Mike McGloin. He is a commodity strategist at Bloomberg and just all around a nice guy. I've known Mike for a little while. Um, Mike, I appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon. How are you doing today? Oh, all good, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be on. And um, I like that nice guy thing because I know you're from Pittsburgh. I worked there for two summers when I was a teenager and I found people from Pittsburgh Generally, very nice people. So I, I, uh, I hold you at high standards. <laughs> we're we're very much different than our uh, Philadelphia counterparts that are <laughs> that are on the East Coast. So we're very much different to them. And you even kind of said it like a Pittsburgher would, like Pittsburgh. So um, so kudos kudos to you. Kudos <laughs> kudos to you. Um, so for those who may not know um, you yourself or your background, why don't you just introduce the readers to who you are and also your background. Um, and then we'll just sort of naturally flow into um, some of your great work you've done covering uh, the Bitcoin and digital asset market. So I'm a chief commodity strategist at Bloomberg, Bloomberg Intelligence. Bloomberg Intelligence is the research arm of Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg started that when he came back from being mayor. So I cover commodities, underlying commodities. My primary goal is to say this is where market's going and why. And what I love about what I do is I'm completely unbiased. I mean, I've been buy side, I've been sell side. I started in trading pits in the 80s in Chicago. And usually you have a bias. And at Bloomberg, my primary goal was getting it right and publishing it on the terminal. And then you see a lot of stuff that gets sent off the terminal. So I focus on all underlying commodities, including cryptos. I really started writing about cryptos 2017. And we just pick the peak um, in Bitcoin and cryptos. And since then we got bullish in 18 and been riding that, riding that wave. Got you. So given your background and I totally agree. I mean, from uh, my perspective of consuming your work, probably what for almost two years at this particular point, I, you know, I could totally concur that it is, it, it's not, it's, there's no underlying tone behind it or perspective behind it, which is something quite rare in the digital asset space for those um, that aren't necessarily familiar with it. You're either uh, firmly on the perma bull or firmly on the perma bear, and it becomes quite vitriol whenever uh, you go against uh, someone's preconceived notions or, or confirmation bias. So it has been quite refreshing to sort of consume that information. With that being said, um, the transition uh, over from commodities, I guess not less so much a transition, but a, a broadening of what you cover, how have you found or walk us through sort of like that experiential path of Bitcoin? Because it definitely rhymes with commodities. I firmly believe that what drives the price of Bitcoin is supply and demand, but there is a few different nuances that you can kind of use or fundamental gauges that you could look at to say this is a proxy for fundamental demand or this is um, you know, a proxy for, for something else. I like that word you use, rhyme, and um, it's definitely true. So I've been very happy with um, our outcome in our look and our calls on Bitcoin and calls, we just say it's going up or down basically, or it's going sideways. And what I find basically everything is from my standpoint, it's a, if, if it's a, a number on the screen, I'll figure it out. If I can't figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, like I've never really been able to figure out livestock so well, but Bitcoin's about supply, demand and price. And you can see my fingers, supply, demand, price. And <laughs> The, the unique thing about it, it's really not about supply because unlike anything I've ever analyzed in, in history, the supply of Bitcoin is a linear shape going down because of, you know, we've already mined almost 19 million of the 21 million coins. Um, we're, you know, and I calculated last year, total new supply was around 4%. This year it's closer to 2%. Next year it's below 2%. That's going to zero. It's going to take a hundred years, but I've never seen that before. So I look at it like the only thing that matters is adoption and demand. So that's the key things I watch for where Bitcoin price is going. And then of course I use many other nuances and things to measure if it's overbought or oversold. And so the key things I see, the reason I've been really sustaining my bullish stance um, since last year is I see most of my adoption, almost all my adoption indicators is pointing positive until that changes because there's not like gold. We can, you know, the price goes up and you bring on the old mines, you bring on new supply. You can't bring on new supply of Bitcoin. I think that's really, really um, telling in all honesty. And whenever I was sort of having my soliloquy before you, you, you know, I, I, I let you take it, I stopped myself from saying a proxy for supply as well, because there is no proxy 
first supply. Like it is just a fixed schedule, a programmatic schedule that will not change. So I, I totally agree with you where there's, there's a lot of different ways to sort of skin demand indicators, but in general, that's what you're looking at. And if you can hone in on it or find reliable data and or signals, uh, it, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. With that being said, were you one of the, um, uh, initial or not initial, but did you look at the stock, the flow, given everything that you said and how you looked at demand principally kind of from the jump, were you one of the ones that initially did not put much weight to the stock to flow model, which has kind of become a little bit maligned as, uh, it's, it's, it's gradually had more and more holes, um, shot into it. Well, I look at it's very, um, just kind of like it's done. It's a, it's a done deal. There's, there's, it's stock to flow. The stock is not going to change. <laughs> there's going to be 900 Bitcoins mined every day until 2024. And then it's going to go down to 450 a day. Done. That's it. So we know as far as stock, as far as flows, okay. Flows can mean trading. I'm not so much interested in that. It's really like thing for, it depends how you look at flows. One of my best metrics I've used is I like, um, addresses used on coin metrics and futures open interest and any type of flows in GBTC, which is the primary you know, the grayscale investment trust. So anything I can find that shows demand and interest, because I look at that supply is just why bother. It's like I had some people ask me, well, have you ever looked at supply in the past? I'm like, yeah, it mattered in the past, but it doesn't matter now. <laughs> Unless something happens with the code, which you would know better than I would. Yeah. I, I mean, I was, I had a I had a hot and cold sort of relationship with stock to flow, but uh, at the end of the day, the the original inclinations were were proved valid. It's it's that you know anything we know that demand is driving this for all the reasons that you sort of said about the supply side. So it just seemed like a overfit model. At the end of the day, um, you know a broken clock is right twice a day, so it still might turn out where we look five years ahead and say, oh wow, stock to flow actually was accurate. A bitcoin, you know, one bitcoin is worth a hundred thousand U.S. dollars or a million or whatever it is. Doesn't necessarily mean that the underlying model was actually um, accurate because it doesn't take demand into consideration. Uh, whenever you look at, speaking of demand, do you just look at all sources in general or do you try to differentiate between retail and institutional flows? Because the reason why I ask is there's, uh, you know, the big rallying cry that has been in digital assets or crypto since 2018, the bubble burst in 17, saying that you need to get in now because the next big wave that's coming, that's going to drive the next, you know, this new bull run of 2017 is going to be the institutional capital flow. So you better get in now so that you don't miss it. We're in 2020 and that really has not come to fruition in any frame or facet. So do you differentiate or is it just demands, demands, demand? I, I yes and no, I do less so, but, um, in, in a sense, a second, maybe I can share my screen with you. I can show some of the metrics to look at. Yeah, let's um, do it. But when the, the term you use, which um, we both heard before, when you hear that term from anybody, you need to get into it now. I usually have a tendency to run the other way. <laughs> and it's just, you know, just, I don't think I'm an old geezer yet, but just you hear that, I'm like, okay, who, you, who what are you selling me? <laughs> and <laughs> and and what's, what's it, you know, what is it? So, um I don't know if you can see that um, that screen yet. Um, no, I can't see it yet. Oh, I have to designate which which size. So I look at it as um, as anything I can find that has a robust indication of demand. I will, and um, oh, so you have to enable me to, to share the screen. Okay. And so the key things I've defaulted to. Tell me when you're ready. Um, the the key things I've defaulted to for that. Yeah, here I'm ready. Okay. Is our, um, I'll show you right now. Do you see a bunch of umbrellas? No, I don't see a bunch of umbrellas. Okay, sure. You'll see it right now. Okay, now you'll see it. You got it. Okay, gotcha. Um, yep, umbrellas. Yeah. So the key things I focus on is, are whatever, um, are what I mentioned, addresses used. But for instance, on my latest outlook, when I, when I sit down to write what I'm going to write about, you probably can see that chart, write about what I'm going to do for the month. I try to have one chart that really tells the story of the market and that's what i did with this chart in orange you have spot gold mm -hmm. so i view bitcoin as a digital version of gold and i know it's a discussion you and i had a little bit earlier 
let's put ourselves mentally into the future 5, 10, 50, 100 years from now. Is digitalization and technology going to go backwards or forwards? And we all know what it's going to do. Linear shape upwards, unless there's some kind of war or something we can't predict. And Bitcoin's right in the forefront of that. It's already been adopted. It's already won the adoption race. So I view it somewhat not replacing gold, but for people who carry their phones around and do everything in the world on their phones, you can store value there or on a, on a hard drive. So gold is another one. And so to me, that's macroeconomic indication I show in the chart in gold. And the other one is more on-chain, and that's Bitcoin active, active addresses used. I just take a 30-day average. Don't want to be too precise. Don't want to be too short-term. And it's moving from the lower left to the upper right. The reason I like to use addresses used, it was precedent in 2018 for the collapse. I mean, it absolutely plunged, even though it's a 30-day average, and stayed down. And when it broke out higher in um, 2019 is when uh, the market followed, just a couple weeks afterwards. So to me, that's a good sign, both good signs of, number one, the macro view and adoption from um, on-chain. Of course, I use other metrics, too, for adoption. Yeah, so if you if you put that back up, uh, uh, just a uh, just for a second. Well, another thing that I like about it. So for for the viewers that are watching, if you notice the uh, the the line for Bitcoin active addresses after uh, two th like in the middle of 2018. So after, or I'm sorry, at the end of 2018, moving into 2019, whenever it finally broke out, price broke out back again. It's largely been using, um, you know, that that. Uh, simple moving average almost as like a support line. So that's good because there has because two thousand the second half of 2019 was largely a crapshoot after you know the Libra pump quote unquote or whatever you think may have driven Bitcoin the price of Bitcoin up to 14,000 per individual coin and then subsequently bled for the last six months of the year before finally hitting a bottom around, you know, high 6,000s. And have since we've gone through our trials and tribulations in 2020, but active address has decreased, but it hasn't had that sort of like catastrophic plummet that you were showing from 2017 to 2018. So again, um, you kind of look at that as resilience from a, from a fundamental demand perspective as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you can narrow it down earlier, like you said, to large addresses and small, and I find that a little too complicated. So far, if, if it's not working, if it is working, I'm not gonna try to fix it, and it's working, so. 100%, I'm a very big proponent of it. If it ain't broke, <laughs> don't fix it. Exactly, better way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, interesting. Is there, so you, so those are your primary demand indicators. Are there, is there anything else that you, that you sort of squarely look at um, whenever you're looking? Uh, Here's a key one that I use. Um, and it's kind of, it's about as transparent as it gets. And what you see in orange is our, our the grayscale, grayscale Bitcoin trust total fund assets in terms of Bitcoin. So it's a, a, over 400 million, bit, sorry, 400,000 Bitcoins now which and at the current pace is, and the current supply mining pace is absorbing about a third of new, new, new coins being mined. So you can just see clearly moving from the lower left to the upper right. Now, the reason I use it is because it's the most trans, it's, it's the big dog out there. It's the most transparent. We don't have an ETF yet. Um, and it's, I think it's around $5 billion now, but that is, I've spoke to the people that I've listened to. That's virtually every type of investors from retail to hedge funds to buy and hold long-term money managers from what I hear. Um, and when that's, you know, if it wouldn't matter if it didn't move so much, but it's, it's the, the trajectory clearly moving higher and it's getting large. Um, and, and now it's got some other companions, but they're nowhere. I mean, the, the largest one I know that's similar is like one tenth the size. So I'm just sticking on the, you know, stick with the, the big one. Okay. Do you think, so do you think it's a positive thing that the slope is sort of beginning to steepen in terms of assets under management for Grayscale? Or do you think it's something that can uh, potentially get ahead of itself? Oh, sure, both. Um, like it looks like the chart of gold and sure it'll get ahead of itself and it'll get overdone. Um, but it's just pattern recognition. It's simple pattern recognition. I remember I was in uh, Hong Kong two years ago, right, be right after the, uh, Typhoon right before the, before the protests. And I was pointing out at the time, Tether was number like 20 on coinmarketcap.com. And I just point out, guys, here's the pattern. 
and everybody took Putin. A lot of people didn't agree with me. Didn't didn't you know? And I was comparing it to Ethereum. I'm like, I'm just pointing out facts. It, the the pattern is it's clearly trending towards greater assets under management. I don't know what's going to take to change that in an environment where it shouldn't be. So that's just one thing I look at. A key thing: pattern recognition and trying to think and think how in, uh, and robust it is. And, this another one here is futures, futures open interest. Now the thing about futures open interest, this is on the CME. It's 65,000 BT, um, BTC at the moment. That's not a lot, but it's clearly two key things. What's the trend? Clearly from the lower left to the other right, upper right. And futures represent a major on-ramp into um, US regulation environment, which is and maybe in exchange, which has been a key issue that the SEC has used to hold back an ETF. Got you. Yeah, I, the, the CME, that's one of the weird things or one of the nuances of this particular asset class is that um, it's still for as far as like the regulatory bodies, it's still or regulated exchanges, it's still finding its traction. Like if you need deep liquidity, you need to go to quite frankly, unregulated exchanges, if you feel like you need to go not use counterparties or OTC, but you have to go um, through a centralized exchange. And that's a little bit, I mean, for uh, crypto funds that, that, you know, have spoke about it to their LPs and their LPs just get it and understand it. But for, you know, from a larger, more sophisticated institutional um, LP perspective, it's going to take a little bit more education and also a little bit more comfortability and or just a flat out non-starter to say like, all right, we need to go to these unregulated digital, like cryptocurrency only uh, centralized exchanges that have enough liquidity for us to be able to hedge our portfolio or be opportunistic whenever we see things, um, you know, potentially looking to break out. Like, for, you know, a personal example is we're a US regulated fund and I wasn't able to really take advantage of the compression period that we saw uh, at post having, we all knew that there was going to be a violent breakout. That's what price, that's what asset prices do whenever volatility gets sucked out. And the simplest way to do it is just to do a straddle. It's like, you don't matter which way the volatility goes, as long as you're set up to make money off the vol. But we can't do that because CME doesn't have the volume necessarily and neither does Ledger Prime. So the spreads are just really, really wide. So that's another nuance, which like you said, is moving in the right direction, but kind of still fall, you know, flies in the face of that narrative that we've been hearing since 2018 is that institutions and sophisticated people are going to, you know, start running in here in droves because if they were, that's where they would be, um, you know, off laying a, a decent amount of their capital, whether it be hedges or, and, or, um, just straight bets. Yeah. Well, I, I come from a futures background and, um, I view Bitcoin, just like you mentioned, as an ideal environment. Actually, I came to New York in 93 to be an over-counter options make, market maker in U.S. Treasuries. I view this space as just the perfect place for market makers. You make an offer out here, make a bid way down there, let someone come to you, hedge your deltas and say thank you next day. Or, you yeah. know, just hedge them all up and take the money, make the money in the spread. And I think there's, but that's what's, what's narrowing right now is just, it's just, it's getting there. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of been like the soup du jour of quantitative strategies uh, within this space, at least in 2020, and probably a latter part of 2019 as well, is market neutral strategies, principally through market making, whether it be it, less and less of the big caps because it's kind of getting sucked out, um, but it's moving further and further down, you know, the top 10s into the top 20s and maybe even a little bit further as well because, yeah, it's essentially free money. Yeah. So, okay, open interest, that is an, that, that's a gauge that I look at um, as well. You mentioned one other one other thing that I'm sorry. Oh, Tether. You mentioned Tether. And yeah. I know that you guys track that as well. I think that's a great gauge um, as well of general direction. So for any listeners that are un, you know, that are aren't familiar with Tether, that is a stable coin that is backed by it's supposedly backed one to one by the US dollar and run by a company called Tether that is notoriously um, less than transparent, let's just say, uh, for <laughs> showing that they do in fact have the reserves uh, to back the market cap that they have of Tether that's out on the open market. So essentially saying, can they verify that uh, the Tether that's out there is in fact back one-to-one -one of US dollars that they have in their treasury? And to this day, I don't believe they've ever 
produced any transparency that would say, yes, we, we do. But regardless, it is still one of the most popular, no, no, not one of the most, it is the most popular uh, stable coin uh, within this space. And it has just been booming this year, given everything that has been going on with COVID, especially in terms of whenever the dollar was appreciating earlier in the year and some of the emerging market currencies were just taking a bath. Uh, given it's digital, like Mike was saying, which way is the world moving? Is it moving digital or is it moving towards analog? It's moving towards digital. So if you live in Turkey and your local currency is taking a bath, but you've got an internet connection, pretty easy to just say, hey, I'm going to take my Lira and convert it to Bitcoin and then convert that to uh, Tether stablecoin if I want to make sure that I'm preserving my purchasing power and not necessarily looking for capital appreciation. Well, I view Tether as, um, key thing you mentioned is it might not be backed, who knows what it's backed by, but the way I look at it is if the market doesn't care, then I don't care. And that was the key indicator last year. Remember it was about April or May when the New York Attorney General came down in Tether. The market had this big correction and poof, it was gone in like two days. Came right back to par. It, it, inflow started coming right. That was right, I'm showing on this chart right about uh, here. It's just a blip. This is a chart of Tether's assets under management. Right about here. And then it just started rocketing. People started using it more and more. And I thought, okay, if market doesn't care, I don't care. That will put in a big bottom in Bitcoin, right about, it was an indication that it was going to break out. So this is a bit of an older chart. I'm just showing the assets on the manager of Tether. Nine billion is the last time I updated. I'm pretty sure it's over 10 now. But um, if there's money, there's, if Tether's obviously the great segue between all other cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin. And to me, it's just part of the whole space that people want to go digital. They can get dollar exposure through Tether. And um, it's an indicator to me. And Bitcoin is just part of that space. Bitcoin is an independent and free one. It's the only one without, you know, it's like gold. There's no one else's liability, but it's all in the same rising tide. And um, that's why I use Tether. But it also gave me that signal. It was last year when, you know, a little bit of a year ago when the market said, we don't care. And I said, all right, fine. That's bullish for Bitcoin. <laughs> um, have you looked at the correlation between uh, between Tether and, and Bitcoin price? I know it'll probably oscillate over time, but I wasn't sure um, if you've got if if you've looked at that in in recent past. Not recently. I can, you know, um, when you, every time you say Tether gets a creation or it has more inflows, it's supposed to be somewhat co coinciding with Bitcoin yeah, moving that's higher. Narrative. I think that's, but it's really subjective. That's one thing about some of these correlations; it's very subjective on your time frame. One hundred percent. Yeah, so that's why I'm like, yeah, I have to be very careful with that. And when people always say, oh, Bitcoin always goes up after the halving, I'm like, okay, well, it did, but it's a little more mature now. <laughs> but it's also like a sample size issue as well. I always yeah. tell people, you know, and I've been, you know, I've been guilty of it myself whenever I've been data mining for additional useful tools for intelligence, which I'm sure you right. have as well. You say, historically, it's done this. It's like, okay, well, what's the sample size of that historical uh, indicator you're looking at? It's like, it's three. It's like, well, that's not necessarily uh, robust, I, I, I would say. So that, that's another very interesting nuance um, of this space, given it's so nascent. You're essentially creating indicators. While, like you're, you know, you're building the car while you're driving it as well. If you're looking at it from, um, you know, a valuation perspective or, or a remotely, yeah, I guess a valuation perspective. You know, we're building the price to earnings ratio and and all the other stuff which is tried and true on traditional stocks um right now like in the in the flesh while it's still trading yeah um exactly and i think we, it's, it sounds like you're one of those astute traders who get it is anytime you hear a widely publicized fact that oh this is what it's done in the past you got to be very careful what that means for the future because it's certainly something that's nascent like this and certainly from, it depends when it comes from who's trying to someone who has a bias, meaning are they, will they make money if it goes up or if it goes down and are they pushing that position? One thing I've really been focused on, and since I've been in this space, I viewed Bitcoin as a digital version of gold. And that's what was my key triggers when, um, all, when Bitcoin started closing above 10,000 and it did it and the LCC allowed US banks to custody and gold broke above 1900, that was the key signal it was supposed to sustain above 10,000. So I can use that as a line in the sand and, um, Bitcoin has no excuse now to break below 10,000. That would be a problem. So that's what I, I do as a strategy. I try to put stops in. And I'm not saying that would happen. I have to do it right now. I would be very concerned if it closes back below 10,000. 
and what I'm showing here, I just I, I just rope into gold a little bit. Is I cannot not use gold because um, I view them as very similar as far as why you people would use Bitcoin. Is what I show here is um, the volatility of Bitcoin divided by the volatility of gold. It's 260 days, so it's one year. I have to keep as um, standardized as possible. Yet the price of Bitcoin in terms of ounces of gold is about six dollars. Now I'm six times. I'm sorry, six ounces of gold. It's been that way since 2017, but the volatility is going way down versus Bitcoin, which leads me to believe is Bitcoin is going to gain the upper hand um, at some point. And typically, when volatility bottoms, it's like like it did here, beginning in 2017. I expect Bitcoin to start outperforming gold. Of course, it trades with a much higher volatility, it's still four times, but it's not as much as it was almost 10 times back in 2018. Got you. So whenever you say outperforming, how do you, how do you measure that? Because um, this year I, I, I put out a, a piece, an article earlier today via Forbes, essentially talking about a lot of stuff that you know, you're, you're referencing here, um, noting gold's outperformance, just the general weaker uh, dollar environment and how that's been driving store value assets, Bitcoin included this year and the charts, like you said, um, are really suggesting that it doesn't seem that 10,000 is, is really going to be retested, at least in the near future or again ever. And it's looking like it's setting up for a multi-year bull cycle, which kind of is alluding to whenever you look at volatility uh, bottoming out around 2016 and then beginning to outperform. So how do you measure outperformance? Because just in a straight percentage wise versus the US dollar, Bitcoin is, it kind of looks like a levered beta play on gold because it's outperforming at around two to one uh, approximately this year. Well, the simplistic way is what you mentioned in terms of just um, the percentage change in US dollar. <laughs> and we all know that's very um, basic and it's okay. And then you can add risk adjusted to that. So I like to use 260 day volatility as a risk adjustment. So basically, um, you look at it, gold is one of the best performing assets on the planet this year, partly if you adjust its volatility. Um, you know, Bitcoin should be up four times the price of the gold. Gold's up 30%. So Bitcoin should be up over 120%, but it's not. It's getting there. I think it is. But the way I really like to do it is, and I heard some criticisms in this in the past, but why not we measure Bitcoin in terms of gold and ounces of gold? Now, people use grams, but the standard Bitcoin is dollars. The standard gold is, out, is in per ounce. So here's what I have in the white line. That's just Bitcoin is trading at six times, uh, six ounces of gold. It's an unchanged since 2017. It's fluctuated between eight and like, two and a half and here we are stuck and I think just simple pattern recognition is just Bitcoin is more much more likely to depreciate versus in terms of the ounces of gold and part of the good indicator is that its volatility is, is declining versus Bitcoin volatility I'm sorry versus gold volatility is on the, on the rise okay I that makes sense simple. no that that makes sense to me and I and I like I, I like it um, I like it in a couple of ways. So thinking theoretical, where do you, do you think that there's a, a specific moment that causes that sort of breakout, so to speak, where Bitcoin really starts outperforming gold, very reminiscent um, to what you saw at the end of 2016 or, or pushing in to 2017. I guess the, the soup du jour, and I even rode the coattails of it with my Forbes article, is talking about the weak dollar. Um, do you think over time that is something that eventually everyone gets to, or do you think that it is more just of a straight fundamental demand um, sort of circumstance where meaning millennials are already, they, they, they're bought in, but it's like now they need to get more into, they need to make more money essentially to be able to invest in it more actively. And there needs to be better avenues outside of Robinhood for them to be able to contribute a consistent portion of their salaries to uh, Bitcoin as a retirement vehicle and then same exact thing for Gen Z. So do you look at it more from that perspective or more from just a straight macro perspective of dollar continuing to depreciate or both of those are shit and there's something kind of you know else? All the above, I think the dollar depreciating is a very minor part of it because how do you measure the dollar versus other currencies? They're all depreciating. Um, and that's how you measure gold gold they're all depreciated versus gold gold doesn't really move it just change, stays as a store of value over time it's that piece of currency you measure it and that really changes and 
big picture because you can still buy a you know an acre of farmland or a house or a men's suit with the same ounces of gold historically fluctuates a little bit but i look at it as all the big picture what you mentioned is what i really look at it let's put that just 30 years in the future where is this going <laughs> we have a stock market that is way overdue for a bear market and it's not even near started <laughs> um we have um, a situation where the whole world's in an unparalleled process of quantitative easing we all know where that's going to end. It's very unlikely it's going to end with organic demand pull forces that are going to make them stop. And it's going to probably some form of currency debasement. I think that's going to end. The end game, I think, for me, is very similar to the exact opposite what Paul Volcker did in the early 80s when he raised rates to squash inflation. We're going to just keep lowering rates until we get real inflation. I, I like to use the narrative. If, if, this, if, we, if the U.S. government gave a million dollars to every, every citizen, do we think we'd get inflation? Sure, it's no, it's no problem getting inflation. So I view Bitcoin as a solid story of value. Um, gold's the same format. Bitcoin's just a newer way to do it. And it's just a matter of time. And I look at it as the word I've been using is prudent. People with prudent investing fiduciary duties know it's their duty to make sure they help preserve wealth and capital for their clients. Gold is prudent over time. Stock market's becoming a little less prudent. Um, and Bitcoin is becoming simply prudent, the way I see it. I really like that. And obviously, I'm super biased because I'm in the space. But that makes, that makes perfect sense um, for how I view a lot of these things. That, that makes a lot of sense, in all honesty. Do you? So I, I like the idea of giving a million dollars to every single, <laughs> every, every, yeah, every, every single person. I mean, that's the only thing that they haven't done just yet. It's like, well, well, screw it. Like, let's just start, <laughs> hand, let's just start handing out a um, million dollars. So this, this strays a little bit, but I guess it's more of like a thought experiment while we're, while we're sort of just sitting here prattling. Um, how do you think this all ends up? Because inflation is one of those things where once it starts moving, it's not really something that you can, you can't really put the, the genie back in the bottle once you get that moving. I realize that the amount of debt overhang we have um, on aggregate demand is incredible. And that is likely going to continue to suppress real inflation for the foreseeable future. But if, like you said, it is, you know, come hell or high water, we're getting inflation we need this because for all the reasons that we sort of talked about, I, I don't see how that ends like really, really well. Again, this is more of just like a, a thought experiment than an actual, you know, sort of analysis we've been talking about, but you've got way more experience and seen way more cycles um, than I have. And that's not a dig at your age. That's a, uh, that's a dig at your experience. No, no. I mean, I, I'm taking it only positive, <laughs> but I always like to say we can all, we can both read. <laughs> And, you know, it's just about study and look at charts and history. And, you know, sometimes uh, mentally you put things into short time frames when you're looking at 100 years or so. But I, what I show in, in this chart here is just a simple narrative of where things are going. Um, and that is what you see in white is central bank balance sheets as a percentage of GDP. Now, that's a, the top four, obviously, Fed, CCB. It's 54 percent. Where do you think that's going to end? It's not going to end. I don't think it'd be wonderful if it does. But. And that's overlaid with the price of gold. So the macro is, um, is central banks are just going to keep easing into this inflation, providing liquidity. And then at some point, I'm pretty sure Volcker proved they know how to squash that. But like you said, you get the cat out of the bag. But right now, that's not even close to the risk. That's why I like to point out is um, when the Fed first started easing in 1987 to help alleviate the stock market crash, they started a situation that I view as unstoppable until we get a bear market and stock market at some point and we've had them since and that to me is when gold and bitcoin will at some point they'll have massive rallies and then at some point peak and we're not even there then so that's what i show here this is just getting started in white balance sheets taken off i'm not even showing debt to, debt to gdp that was you know it's well over 100 percent. japan is 300 percent, and look at that the lowest rates in the world so why wouldn't they just keep ballooning the balance sheet until interest rates go up and the, the currency collapses. They should. I mean, now, now, that's one thing I always like to rope into. It's human nature for politicians to not stop doing what they're doing to get votes until they're made to. So priming pumps, MMT, pumping systems with, with writing checks to um, giving all the unemployment benefits possible without any repercussions means they're going to keep doing it. 
until markets make them stop. It's just human nature. 100%. I mean, I, if someone was like, if you said, hey, Chris, I'm going to continue to give you money and, you know, you pay me back whenever you, you want to. And, I, and you just keep giving me money week after week and there's really no expiration date on when I need to repay you. Why wouldn't people just continue to just take it and take it and take it? Especially whenever it's been such a long time. It, it's, there's such vested interest to continue to do it, like you said, for elections. But also, I, always, I, I likened it before, it's just a game of make-believe. Money is just a game of make-believe. And we're all just playing Peter Pan. I think the, and, and that's not a problem. Like, I, that, that is okay. It's work for millennia. The issue becomes whenever the politicians and the powers that be in central banks start playing the game as if it's not make-believe, and or, or they start playing the game with disregard for the fact that it's make-believe. Because like everyone has these collective blinders on, and it's like we know, but we're we're still playing, we're still playing along. But whenever you come out and say, this is all make believe. I'm going to do whatever I want to because it doesn't matter at the end of the day. I think that's whenever you start having serious issues. Um, you know, maybe not today, tomorrow, a year, 10 years down the line, but ultimately you're sort of like sowing those particular seeds uh, of bad outcomes down the, uh, down the path. Yeah, well, I, I like how we, we can, I don't know how long we want to stick in the macro, but I'll have to show you the one chart I mentioned. Um, I was just talking about, so I'll show you the chart of the macro and um, what you see in white is CPI. That's US CPI, it's clearly trending lower. And then we have Fed funds in pink and we have treasury 10 year notes yields, they're all clearly heading lower. My point is you look at the opposite of the 1980s, how did we squash inflation? Fed funds got well above uh, um, inflation. How are we gonna squash deflation now? The exact opposite and what's gonna stop it? Just what we discussed, nothing. I don't know of right now. <laughs> I don't know what's going to stop that. That's why hard money and Bitcoin could be the hardest money ever on the planet. It could fail. And that's why I think, well, it's prudent to have one or 2% of your investable assets in Bitcoin along with gold and keep adding there. And the key thing I point out is one well, for gold, the problem I've had in a good way from in a bad way for the stock market is gold's been outperforming the stock market for a while now. It depends on what period, certainly since the beginning of the millennium, for certain since the Fed first started tightening in 2015. And I mean the total returns basis. So when the rock beats stocks, and people tell me the stock market's potentially a bit um, expensive, I look at it like, well, why not just stick with the rock? And to me, Bitcoin is just another version of gold. Um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I, it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it makes incredible, it makes incredible sense. And then whenever you, like, I think this chart is particularly powerful because um, it makes sense. It's like, they're going to do the opposite and there's no end in sight. So if you believe that, then you, just like you said, you want to go after hard currencies. And then if you look at the premise of the future, Bitcoin could be that, or you could just, you know, straight up take uh, Paul Tudor Jones is like, I'm going to look for the fastest horse in the race, if, you know, from a store of value perspective. And guess what? Like that is, that is Bitcoin. And it seems to be not running nearly as fast as it could be based upon that prior, um, you know, ratio chart that you that you had shown uh, versus ounces of gold, which is, I think that's the next really, really interesting thing uh, because there's going to be a next big push up. The question is when and what's going to be the catalyst. I have kind of thought before, I, I do believe in the retail narrative. I do believe in the weakening dollar and just essentially everything you have here. But one of the, you know, big outliers that I've looked at is the potential for institutions to allocate or larger institutions to allocate a quote unquote meaningful amount to digital assets like Bitcoin because as a way to quickly try to shore up their unfunded liability. So if you're a CalPERS and you're saying like, okay, crap, we've got 68% uh, unfunded liabilities. All right, quickly, how can we in, you know, next year, next two years, or the next three years, 30% of boomers that we have to pay out to are retiring. How can we quickly shore this up? All right, quick, last five years, what's got the highest expected return? Bitcoin, digital assets. Okay, uh, 
uh, let's let's look at what we can invest in grayscale, you know, some aspect, like let's park 1%, 2%, 5% in there as a way to essentially do what kind of got us in to this issue in terms of stocks or, or some of the other um, illiquidity premium type investments from 08 once Fed turned, turned the spigot on uh, is yield chasing. So that's been long my thesis is like, if that happens, then that could be the oh shit, like buckle up moment. Well, you can also include good old Saifedean and Amos is um, a Bitcoin standard and central banks in that. I mean, like you just said, what's your risk of one to two percent versus your potential of missing out? And I'm not a FOMO guy, but I, I have solar panels on my house. I've got an electric car and 10 years ago, I couldn't do that cost effectively. Where's that going to be 10, 20 years from now? <laughs> I just don't, it's that to me, it's simple cost benefit analysis, risk reward. And so I, one thing I've really enjoyed is. I'm going to dig in a little bit to um, Bitcoin versus NASDAQ for a reason, and I'm going to let you stray away from that if you'd like. No, no, no. Because I keep hearing this narrative that gold is getting uh, into a frenzy. Uh, and then also Bitcoin um, was a frenzy, we know, but it's had a good full three years to correct, which is what you need. And that's why I like to show the Nasdaq's up 500% on a 10-year basis. Gold's up maybe 60%. Which one's a frenzy? <laughs> you know, so... Um, I'll segue into that real quick and then we can dig back a little bit. I just want to show one thing on why I'm starting to get really worried and why I mentioned. So to me, um, I'll show you a chart here. Uh, to me, this whole thing with negative interest rates will happen when one of these Americans who quoted said everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face about negative interest rates. To me, that's what's going to happen with negative rates. Everybody says we're not going to have them in the States. Well, we had them in Japan. I used to trade JGBs. We got it in Europe. It's going to happen here, I think. And the only way, the key thing that will happen is when the stock market goes down, meaning the bear market, that's your punch in the face. We haven't had that. I mean, a real bear market. For the last two years, it goes down a third and stays down, maybe, maybe even 40%. The key thing is Bitcoin is becoming, it's actually compared to the NASDAQ on a risk-adjusted basis, it's the least risky ever. And that's what I show in this chart. In white, you have annual volatility of Bitcoin divided by the same um, bit of volatility on the NASDAQ. It's the lowest ever. It's only Bitcoin volatility is only almost 1.7 times that of NASDAQ. The average, I mean, it's been as high as, uh, oh, let's see, it's been as high as, as five. And then you actually, actually, less than that. And then you look at the um, price of Bitcoin divided by the NASDAQ. It's unchanged since 2017. So to me, when NASDAQ broke above 10,000 and Bitcoin did too, I said, okay, Bitcoin's gaining the upper hand. Now they're both above 11,000. I think as far as, just don't take my opinion, the, the risk looking at volatility is Bitcoin's gaining the upper hand in terms of its risk adjustment. Uh, so the key point we're making is in white, you have volatility on Bitcoin divided by volatility on the NASDAQ. It's 260 days, so it's a year at the lowest level ever. And in orange, that's just the price of Bitcoin divided by the NASDAQ. It's been hovering around one to one right now. It's both about 11,000 for three years now. So the point is, at some point, this ratio should break out higher, i.e. Bitcoin to outperform the NASDAQ. And a key indicator is Bitcoin is becoming, is right now, is the least risky on a volatility measured basis ever versus the NASDAQ. Fascinating. I think it's incredibly fascinating because like I said before, that's, that's been one of the rallying cries and one of the poo poo statements of people that have existing biases or, or whatever vested interests as to say why Bitcoin will never be uh, a store of value asset, why Bitcoin uh, will never have institutional investors allocate to it in a significant way because of the volatility tied to it. It's like, yeah, Bitcoin can still rally 20%, you know, 23% or, or a little bit more now um, over what a, a 14 day period or a little bit more from whenever it sort of had a launching pad for 9,200. It's like, yeah, of course it can be volatile. But again, this chart, I, I think puts it into perspective or this ratio puts it into perspective um, of, of the true power or potential for risk adjusted returns of Bitcoin in relation to some of these other assets that have become uh, sacrosanct as what should be invested in from a prudent portfolio. So there you go. That we're coming up with that word prudent again. <laughs> it's like I, I was worried that when I wrote my last outlook, the editors would take it out, and that's what I'm always working with editors. Obviously, we use proper language and don't curse and stuff. But um, 
they kept it in. And I think because they believed me. And they said, well, hey, it's just the potential of becoming prudent. So nice. Okay. But here so. I'm just showing that this is just a chart of I'm, I like to overlay at the same price recently. In white, we have Bitcoins running around 1200, NASDAQs running around 1100. What has the most upside? And this is just back to that little, little narrative we talked about earlier is um, I think the next big thing we're supposed to be thinking about in, as investors at some point when we get an equity bear market, I didn't say if, probably in my lifetime, hope they live a long time. Well, how market's going to react. I suspect it might be happening soon and now. I mean, if not now, when? Um, as we get into, we started the V-shape recovery. Now I think the markets are going to flatline. Um, and you can have, a bear market can be just unperforming for a long time. What's going to happen with all the other assets, with Fed, with Fed easing, with, with bond yields, um, with Bitcoin? And I think that's going to be the potential illusion I use to the punch in the face, where I don't see gold bottoming until near the nadar the next stock bear market because i think that's going to bring on potential negative interest rates and i think bitcoin's in that same bucket the thing is gold might double or triple bitcoin can go 10 and it's not going to do what it did in the past it's going to do much slower less volatile but it's still new it's only been around 10 years gold's been around five thousand years yeah i don't think if you propose the specter of any individual investors or portfolio or a component of the portfolio going up 10 X over, let's just say, I don't know, one, five years, 10 years, whatever. I don't think anyone would look at you and say, Hey Mike, like, come on, like we, we need to juice the returns a little bit. I think everyone's going to be pretty, uh, pretty happy to, to hear and, and look at those. And I, I agree. I always try to tell people or articulate whether it's to my investors or to other people that I'm just speaking to is, uh, you know, I'm of the firm belief that the most recent history of Bitcoin is going to be, is going to reflect the, the future. So it would, if you were in at the beginning, the wild west days and your investment was up a thousand X or a hundred thousand X or what, you know, kudos to you, you, you crushed it. You're in the right place at the right time. You only need to get lucky once and get rich once. But I don't, I think if people are coming into the space expecting that, they're going to be sadly mistaken. But with that being said, 10x is still an amazing return on your investment for what, from a, you know, portfolio perspective, or even just an investment cycle is, is still a very short period of time. Yeah, well, I, I, in my narrative, my, my take in Bitcoin one year at a time is this year should be a double. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's getting close to that now, and I have to admit, I haven't changed it all. And it was very simple pattern recognition. Bitcoin had rallied to near 14,000 last year, and it had the benefit of ending this year near 7,000. Very simple mean reversion. It goes right back to last year's high. That's a double. And it just needs a catalyst to do that. Now, you got a pretty darn significant catalyst um, with this, what's happening with the macro, with COVID and gold. And that's kind of where I use this simple chart where okay, it's just kind of falling gold. Bitcoin's correlation to gold is not that high at around 0.4, but it's the trend that matters. Number one, it's the highest ever. This is 52 weeks. Again, I use almost always annualized measures. So I, you know, I have to be careful at Bloomberg and make sure I'm not being too cute. Um, but it's the highest Bitcoin to gold um, correlation ever. And our, our database is back to 2010. Um, and it's clearly the trend, the, the correlations are increasing. So that's why I keep putting in the same bucket. Really, really interesting. Uh, I mean, it's it's clear as day whenever you just look at just the overall trend. It's just clear as day. Like it's going, it's going one particular way, and that 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 way is up. Um, so, so us as traders, what what what? Asking you a question. What do you think it's gonna? I'm really want to debate this. What's gonna end this? What's gonna make it to end this trend? What could make this? What do we have to worry about? So I, I think there's, there might be two things. One is like fallacy of illusion where people who actually think that Bitcoin is a store of value are sort of deluding themselves. And it's just a really uh, highly speculative investment that sometimes reflects a, a store of value. So whenever you talk about when, you know, the, the quote unquote, the shit hits the fan and there is a true bear market and or potentially a true panic, um, then Bitcoin is going to drop substantially again, which each and every single time, you know, you have 
instances like that, it kind of takes a jab at the confidence of the system. Like March really took a jab at the confidence of even the diehards of Bitcoin that we're talking, that I was talking to, um, even that of big funds and stuff like that, just because they kind of look silly because they were out talking and, and telling investors and potential investors that it's this new store of value and it just completely crapped the bed on and 50% within one day. I think had Bitcoin not recovered as quickly as it did, then you could potentially see a lasting um, reputation hit to Bitcoin, which certainly affects the inflows of demand that we saw. So th that's one of the things that I think um, could happen where we could just all be deluding ourselves. And the other one is just, you know, as easy as unexpected um, outcomes from this unprecedented uh, experiment, monetary experiment. Like, I, I don't know in which particular fashion you can slice it up to, to hyperinflation. You can slice it up to there's still deflation is on is on the table which typically is, I, I don't know, but what I do know is nothing like this has ever been done in like the history of recorded man. So I don't, we don't have a playbook for how this ends. And typically whenever that happens and there's negative incentives involved, it typically doesn't end well. Yeah. Well, I think we're on the same page and it's kind of hard to add or take from that one. I, I look <laughs> at it in a similar way. And actually one thing I did view is as a strategist, I, you know, it was kind of tough to ride through that period in March, but I viewed it as very bullish. And here's why coming from the trading pits, the market never stopped trading 24 seven. It did not have one limit up or down. Definitely not down. Like, I don't know how many times have we met the limit in the S&P 500. A lot. 24 seven sure wasn't completely liquid from a guy who started in the trading. I started in 1988 working at the night desk in Chicago board of trade to trade in Japan. Cause that was the first time they started trading where you could do it. Um, open outcry 24 seven or not 24 seven, but adding. And to me, this is just, it's always trading. It's always there. You can always get liquidity. It's just, this is impressive. And on a risk adjusted basis, when you had the worst, correction in the stock market since the 1930s and Bitcoin only dropped 50%. That's meh. It's not a big deal. And I look at it, it, Bitcoin traded me to me very much like gold did in 2008. It dropped 30% from about around a thousand down to 700. Boom. And then within three years, it was 1900. To me, that's what Bitcoin is more likely can, the, the term you used earlier, that's the rhyme I'm looking for and expecting in Bitcoin. Very, very interesting. I, I that that makes sense, and and I wasn't entirely sold on the fact that it was a store of value at that particular point. I thought that it was transitioning to that, and I still do think it's transitioning to a full fledged store of value to the point where, um, you know, you fast forward thirty years, forty years, and it'll just only be the old fogies or the really, really like crazy people living in bunkers that are like, no, I need gold hard gold in my hand, bullion cubes in my bunker. I, I think Bitcoin's well on its way to that. But you brought up a good point that, I, that I've mentioned before is Bitcoin is a free market. There's no intervention. There's no Fed actions. There's no limit up, limit down. It is truly an Adam Smith paradise where okay, like, let's just, the, let's let the market decide how things sort of play out. And each, and, and yes, it's violent in the near term, but each and every single time that happens, it makes the system more robust, more anti-fragile, to, to quote um, Nassim Taleb a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly powerful, again, which makes me more comfortable that, if the bad experience, the uh, exogenous factor that does happen, if and when it ever happens, uh, you know, the further that date gets pushed of whenever that happens, the more and more likely that Bitcoin is going to come out uh, on a positive perspective and not necessarily ride the wave how it did in March because it gets more resilient and more robust each and every single time it has shocks of the system like that. Exactly. It, 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 it weathered another shock. You know, but I, I have to just follow up. I love the bunker analogy. I have a son who's a U.S. Marine. And I, we have these conversations we had before. He's moved on past that. And we always had this joke. Well, if it ever gets that bad, you know what we really need? Guns and ammo. Number one, not only because you can take whatever you want, you need to defend yourself. But ammo, like nine millimeter ammo, would probably be the most utilized 
currency because it's something that people would need. And nine millimeters, kind of like the, the basic. I'm not a gun guy. He's a Marine. He is. But that was kind of our conclusion. It's so funny that you brought that up. I, I did another podcast last week um, with Josh Olkovitz, and he he's a he's a technical chart guy. But somehow that came up, and I, I said I had in my undergraduate. I had a, a former like Wall Street vet. He was teaching corporate finance and capital markets. His name was Jay Sukitz. And he always said, this was back in like 08 or whatever, or 09, kind of like post this crazy stuff. And he was pointing out some particular like interest rate. And he was saying like, hey, if this ever gets past this level, I, I don't remember what it is. He's like, you don't need gold. You don't need stock equities. You need guns and hand, or I'm sorry, you need handguns and canned goods. You don't need yeah. to worry about any of that. So that's whenever yeah. I hear of like truly like the anarchists and this, yeah. that and gold and you need bullion. It's like, no, at that point you need land. We need arable land where we can uh, yeah. farm for ourselves. We need weapons to protect ourselves, ammo as well. And we need canned goods immediately. Well, I'm thinking ammo is also as a currency, like cigarettes in prison. I, look at, look at this. We're, <laughs> we're, we're solving, we're solving uh, <laughs> doomsday issues and simultaneously crapping on anarchists at the, at the same exact time. <laughs> or, or, well, that's or, entertaining. I really appreciate the conversation with you. No, this has been, uh, this has been great. Uh, before we wrap up here, is there anything um, that you want to let the people know that are, that are listening, A, where to find you, but also maybe something that you've got coming up. Like, I know you kick out these uh, monthly reports. I don't know if that's coming out anytime soon, but if you have anything on the radar that you want to make sure that the people listening uh, know about, now, now's your time. Yeah. Um, first week of the month, I put out a Bitcoin and, and current and commodity outlook. They're both different publications. So the Bitcoin, I'm sorry, cryptocurrency, Bloomberg Crypto Outlook. And you can find, just Google that Bloomberg Crypto Outlook and you can get on the list and be and get part of it. You can link in with me. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm happy to link in with most people and happy to ask some people on my distribution list. I'm on Twitter, but I just don't have the time to respond on Twitter. I can only, I do a lot more on LinkedIn. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, perfect. Um, this has been great. We look forward to having you back on future episodes because this is, I've learned a bunch throughout this, uh, throughout this chat. So I look forward to have you back whenever, uh, hopefully there's been some demonstrable changes and maybe we'll be looking, um, at Bitcoin when it'll be, you know, at 14,000 the next time we have you back. So I really appreciate it until next time, everyone, um, we'll talk to you soon.